everybody? How's it going? So, hands up quickly, who here's used Livewire? Most people? Okay, that's pretty good. Hands up if you've heard of verbs. Most people again, that's pretty good. Who's used verbs? <laughs> A couple of people? Okay. So today we're going to be talking about verbs and live wire in action. As Michael said, I'm Josh Hanley, and I'm one of the core maintainers of Livewire. I'm a top contributor to Verbs, and I'm also a senior engineer at Thunk, which is a small Laravel agency. So today we're going to talk about a, building a common language from our UI to the database. The way that language we're going to use is actions. We're going to have a look at today how verbs and live wire were made to be together, made to be together and share a common language through our actions. So what is an action? An action is something that can be done. An action is something that is happening. An action is something that has been done. So who can perform actions in our system? Well, users can perform actions, but also our app can also perform actions, whether through jobs, etc. So how do we describe an action? We describe an action using verbs. And no, I don't mean the package, I mean the words. <clears throat> so what is a verb? A verb is a word used to describe an action. Fitting, right? So today we're going to have a look at three things. We're going to have a look at how we can make actions available to our users. Then we're going to have a look at how we can process our user actions. And finally, we're going to have a look at how we can record those actions taken by our users. So let's start with making actions available to our users. For this, we're going to use Livewire. So Imagine we've built an app for our blog, pretty standard, right? And we've got a draft post sitting there ready to go, and we want to publish it. So in our UI, we might have a publish button. Looks something like that, pretty straightforward. In our blade code, we might just have a button definition like this. And we then wire it up with Livewire to perform an action when we click on it. So we'll add a wire click, and we're going to call a publish method. So if we now have a look at our edit post page, we've also added a publish method. So in Livewire, all public methods on our components are actually actions that are available to our users. So what we've done is we've wired our button up, we've presented that button to our users, but the public API is actually also the component itself. So Pretty much everything in Livewire is an action that's possible for our users to take. So we have our button that's being displayed. We have the definition of our button is also an action. And finally, the publish method in our component is also an action. So using actions, we can actually use a consistent language from the label that we display on the button all the way through to the methods that we have on our components. So that's making our actions available to users. So how can we then process our user actions? So if we have a look at our edit post page component again, we have an empty publish method. So to publish a post, we may need to authorize to make sure the user has permission to update the post. Then we'll validate it, make sure it has a title, content, maybe some tags, what have you. Next, we can actually update our model, set the title, set the content, and actually set the publish stat to be now. We'll synchronize our tags if we have any. But then we might also want to um, post to social media to say that the new post is actually being published. So we'll dispatch a job for that. But we've also got subscribers for our newsletter, so let's get them. And maybe we send them a new notification saying that the new post has been published. And finally, we redirect to our post show page to make sure that it published correctly and everything's good. Now, if any of you have seen my Laracan AU talk from last year, 
building a maintainable Livewire application, you'll know that having large methods like this in our Livewire components makes our applications more difficult to maintain. So what can we do with a big method like this? Well, we can extract it into what's called an action class. An action class is just a basic PHP class that has a handle method on it where we can put some business logic. The benefit of an action class is we can also unit test all of our business logic in a nice, neat package. So here I've got a published post action class it has an empty constructor and an empty handle method. So the first thing we'll do is we'll pass in our post and any of our post data into the constructor. Now, if we pull up our edit post page component that we had a minute ago, we can take everything that we had in the, in the publish method and copy that across into our handle method on our action class. What that means is we now no longer need this in our component, so we can get rid of that. And instead, we can new up our publish post action, pass in the data that we need, and call the handle method. So as a bit of a recap as to where we are so far, we've presented a button and an action to our user in the UI, which links to Livewire through our wire click publish, which then calls the publish method on our Livewire component, which again is the available API to our users. But then we're now actually calling the publish post action to um, process our user actions. So that's processing user actions. So the last step is looking at how we can actually record the actions taken by our users. A good thing for this, the way we can do this is through event sourcing. So what is event sourcing? Hands up how many people have actually not heard of event sourcing? A couple of people? So according to Martin Fowler, the fundamental idea of event sourcing is that of ensuring every change to the state of our application is captured in an event object. Or to simplify that, whenever something happens, we capture that action in an event. But that's actually just the first piece of event sourcing. That's the event in event sourcing. The second piece of it is using those events to determine what state our data is in. So today, we're going to have a look at event sourcing using verbs. So what is verbs? Verbs is an event sourcing package built for Laravel by these two guys, Chris Morell and Daniel Colborn. So why was verbs built? Verbs was built to make building event sourcing apps in Laravel a lot more accessible. It has a simpler implementation, and it has a more obvious naming scheme. Typically, when we hear about event sourcing, it has a lot of technical jargon, but it also is wrapped up with concepts such as DDD, CQRS, and these other things. You'll tend to see terms like aggregate routes, projectors, projections, reactors, repositories, entities, bounded context, ubiquitous language, Command and query response, ugh, can't even say it, command and query responsibility segregation. All of this is too much, it's too hard for, to get started in event sourcing. So verbs simplifies it down to two main concepts. We have events and states. For today's talk though, we're just gonna focus on events and how we can use events in our applications. So what is an event? An event is a thing that has happened or has taken place. Or another way to put it, an event is a record of actions that have happened. So let's have a little look at what a verbs event class might look like. So we've published our post, so we can have a post published event. It's just a standard PHP class that extends the verbs event class. Now, depending on the scenario, this could be an event, and you just fire it off just like that and not need anything else in it. So how do we fire an event? The first way we can fire an event is we can call post published colon colon fire. What happens here is the event actually gets fired by verbs and stored in memory. 
but it doesn't get persisted to the database. What this allows is allows us to fire off multiple events first, and then finally we can call verbs colon colon commit to persist our events to the database and handle any side effects. But there's a shorthand way we can also just call post published colon colon commit if we're only firing one event. But the event, empty event that we had before isn't much good in our case because our post has data. So let's have a look at some of the data we can put into an event. In verbs, all public properties are captured and stored in the event when it gets stored in the database. So if we have a look at our published post event, we can add a constructor in that accepts all of our data from before. But verbs also supports having uh, public properties directly on the class and not needing the constructor at all. Verbs events can also have a bunch of methods on it to help us do things. So if we pull our event back up, we can see they can have an authorized method, a validate method, an apply method. Finally, they can also have a handle method. Today, we're just going to focus on the handle method, so let's get rid of the other three. Is this class starting to look familiar to anybody? <laughs> if we have a look at our post publish event and push it off to the side and pull up our pub publish post action class that we created earlier, we can see these two classes are pretty similar. Well, as you probably guessed, we can actually take everything that's in the handle method from our action class and put it in the handle method of our event class. This means, though, that we don't actually need our action class anymore, so let's just get rid of it. <laughs> now, there's one small little caveat, though. We've directly copied most of that across, but we need to be good verbs citizens. The reason for this is, in event sourcing, there's a concept called replays. The way replays work is you can actually take all of the events that have happened and replay them from the beginning to generate some new data or data in different shape, et cetera. The problem with this is, in our handle method before, we are dispatching jobs to post on social media, we're sending emails to our subscribers, and we don't want these things to happen again when we replay through our events. So verbs has a helper method called verbs unless replaying. And what we've got to do is put inside a closure anything that should only be a one-time effect, such as sending emails, dispatching jobs, etc. So if we have a look at the handle method from our event, where we've got post to social media and our subscribers notifications, we'll take all of that and wrap it in verbs unless replaying to ensure that if we do ever replay through our events, that they don't get called again. So now that we have our verbs event all built and constructed, let's update our live wire component. So we've got our edit post page here, and before we were calling our publish post action class. So let's get rid of that, and instead, we're just going to call post published colon colon commit. Then we'll pass in any of our post data. So what's just happened? We've changed our action class essentially to be an event, but what we've enabled is allows us to capture the action that our user has taken and store it in our database. This is just the start of event sourcing. If you do want to learn some more, there's things like states, validating events, replays, and more. To learn some more about it, I highly recommend checking out any of Daniel Colborn's Grand Slam talks from Laracon from the last year, where he goes through, introduces verbs, here on stage at Laracon AU and explains how it all works. But for our purposes, we are just going to fire events today. Or as John Drexler recently stated on the Talking Business League podcast, all I'm asking you to do up front is just start tracking events. I'm not even asking you to run your business logic based on states. I just want you to fire events all over the place. Or as he more succinctly put it a few seconds later, just start firing events. So why should we record user actions? Or well, a better question to ask is probably, why should we use event sourcing? One of my favorite things for using event sourcing is for bug fixes. I had a client recently who had a user that had called him up 
and said, um, I sent a quote to, I sent an email quote to one of my users, uh, one of my customers, but um, when they clicked on the link, it uh, didn't work. So uh, that's strange. So thankfully, we'd actually event sourced this app, and so we'd fired off a quote sent event. So it was a simple matter for us just to have a look in the database, have a look at the quote sent event, and what we could see is we could see the email details, the subject, and the content of the email. Now, the system generated email has the quote link as a signed URL, so they can send it to customers without them being able to log be logged in. But of course, our users can actually adjust the email before they send it on to their customers. What that meant, though, is they'd obviously deleted the link and decided to put it somewhere else in the email, and so they've just copied the link of the quote from their URL and pasted it straight into the email. Now, of course, you need to be logged in to see a quote, so when they send it to their customer, the link didn't work. So it's just a simple matter for us to look, to go in, change her template, add the system generated link back in for her, and she was off and running again. Another good reason for using uh, event sourcing is for database schema changes. So we can actually change the structure of our tables, of our data, and actually use verbs to replay events to rebuild our data in whatever structure that we require. As I mentioned earlier, though, replays are a whole talk on their own. I highly recommend exploring with them and experimenting with them because they're one of the most powerful features of event sourcing. In line with that, event sourcing is also great for building new features without being locked into the current database structure. You can build your new features as if they're greenfield features, shape the app and data exactly as you need it, then you can just replay events to fit into that new structure. Another big draw card for event sourcing is auditing. Auditing and history logs are inherently built into event sourcing. We have a full record of every action a user and the system has taken, when it was taken, and what data was changed. Another good example of where event sourcing shines is user analytics and data aggregation. Speaking of new features, has anybody ever been asked to build this new dashboard that shows some metrics in some really specific way that requires you to create this really nasty SQL query with complex joins, complex subquery selects, to generate the data to fit into our charts on our, onto our screen. I'm, just, I'm sure Jess knows exactly what that's like at the moment. <laughs> what if we could just create the ideal table? That's exactly the right structure to, to do a simple select query to display that data in our charts on the screen. We're using event sourcing. We can just build that dashboard in an ideal world as if it's a green field feature then we can actually re use replaying to re repopulate the events and populate the data into those new tables. Daniel had this awesome slide last year that states, what happened never changes, but what it means changes a lot. So by capturing all these events, we can use these events to structure our apps in whatever way we desire in the future, because we know exactly what has happened. But how we use it changes. So as a recap, we have our publish method in the UI, which is action available to our users, which is linked to LiveWire using wire click to the publish method. And now our publish method is now calling our post-published event which is both handling recording of our user action and processing of it. So that's how we can record actions taken by users. So what we've managed to do is we've managed to create a common language from the UI all the way through the database using actions. That publish verb is something that's being displayed in our UI and it's also shown in our database as our post-published event. If any of you uh, need any help with any live wire, any verb stuff, uh, come and see us at Thunk. Uh, more than happy to help you guys out. Or if anyone wants to come and talk verbs, live wire, I happily talk about it all day long. Um, 
Marty thankfully earlier said that you should probably add a little caveat in at the end of this talk. Uh, and that was, the way we've gone through this process today is more typically for a greenfield app, right? If you've got an existing model, so imagine we've just put this post-published event into our app and I already had an existing eloquent model for my post. The problem is uh, verbs won't have an event for the, for the post to be created in the first place, right? So it won't exist. So it's a good idea to actually capture any existing data in your system first. You might have just like a post was previously created event or something like that, that you fire off, process through your existing data and fire off before you start firing new events in your system. Or if you're feeling like that might be too much work, uh, Daniel actually recommends just taking a database back up. And so then for any models that you are now storing events for, you can then go back and distinguish what was non-evented data before the event started firing. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>I was ready this year because last year, Josh was very early on his talk and I was like backstage and I was like, I gotta go and be on the theater floor. So I was ready for a shorter talk this year. Good. And um, what are the storage and, and or database performance implications of firing events everywhere basically? Um, so there is one, only one event table at the moment in verbs. Mm -hmm. So that table can get pretty big. Uh, we do have someone testing it in production at the moment. So Verbs is not quite 1.0 yet. We're pushing pretty hard to get it fully released. There is a guy using it in production at the moment. I think he's got like 27 million events so far. Okay. And he says it's fine. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> take that with what you will. All depends on your database, I suppose. Um, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Um, do you need to version your events in some way? Like, how does it work if you want to replay events when you've added or removed properties? Mm. So at the moment, and hence why we don't have a 1.0 yet, uh, <laughs> sure. event versioning is a problem, right? Because if the data's in the wrong format and you've changed your event, you've put different public properties on it, when the event tries to restore, mm -hmm. that data won't fit the same shape. So event versioning is a thing where we can actually transform the data before the event gets yeah. um, built in memory, essentially. That's something we're... They're definitely yeah. looking into. So. If you ever try to unserialize an object that's stored, uh, yeah. bad things can happen. <laughs> Anyone's um, got any good ideas? We're open to them. <laughs> I've, I've got some ideas, but you won't like them. <laughs> <laughs> With Sam, we did some horrible things. Oh, last Sam. Year, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of Sam, how would you look to implement event sourcing into an existing large application? Um, to get used to it, I would try and start with any new Eloquent models, mm -hmm. right? So if you had an existing Eloquent model, as I said before, you would have to capture all that existing data somehow into the event system. Yep. Uh, if you had a new model, though, that you're introducing, that's a perfect use case to get started in event sourcing without having to worry about tweaking anything else beforehand or doing capturing of events or processing of your existing database, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Have you ever run into any issues with IDs changing with replays? Like uh, IDs changing? Yeah, like theoretically it shouldn't, but someone might go much. Uh, so in verbs, we recommend using snowflakes. Mm -hmm. um, so that way then we don't have a problem with incrementing IDs to potentially change when you replay the events, etc. Snowflakes are a really long integer. But actually, side note, if you're using verbs with Livewire, a snowflake is actually longer than JavaScript's Max yes, integer limit, right? So years. if ever you're outputting a an ID, an in, a snowflake string. to be used in Livewire, make sure you wrap it in quotes to make it a string. Yes, <coughs> or use uh, eloquence casting to do it. Yeah, we have also run into that issue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a fun. We're like, why are all these numbers suddenly ending in zero? Getting truncated. Or it only gets changed by a couple of numbers. Yeah. yeah. No, it's bad. It's so hard to debug. I'm just vamping because you finished early. I'm waiting to That's make right. sure that yeah, the whole yeah. Laravel team is back there. No problem at all. Uh, how do you deal with replaying events over time if the actual code and the handle method changes? If the code and the handle method changes? Um, Did you say you just don't do that? Well, no. So, <laughs> so the whole idea is you can change what's in the handle method, mm -hmm. right? So. Um, you know, you saw before that I had a post model and I had some tags models, right? But maybe, maybe when we first built it, we were doing like real MVP like Keith and just putting all the tags into a column on the post model, right? So the handle method would literally just punch that straight into the post model like that, right? Mm -hmm. 
But in future, we decide we're going to split it to be two models. We're going to have our tags because they're you know, used across the system, and then we'll have our posts. So we can actually update our handle method to use both models, create the both models, yeah. or link them, or whatever it might be. And then we replay our events and actually puts it into the new structure. OK, cool. Um, how do you deal? I mean, this is a difficult question to answer, maybe, because Verbs is only 18 months old. But how do you deal with event storage after like 10 years? Good question. I'll tell you in about. What did you say, 18 months? Yeah. Uh, eight and a half years? Eight and a half years. <laughs> um, and this is, um, I mean, Daniel's was a, an introduction to event sourcing last year, his talk, that is a, a more approachable take on what event sourcing is, because a lot of it often is very jargon heavy. Yeah. Um, so someone, uh, Cass said, this is the first talk that's made them actually want to dig into event sourcing. So thank you for making it oh, accessible. That's fantastic. Glad to hear it. Great. <laughs> No worries. Thanks again, Josh. Thank you.